Hi everyone, I'll be talking about Master Key KDM Secure Identity Based Encryption from Pairings. This is a joint work with Sanjam Garg and Mohamed Ajabadi. First, let me give you some context on KDM security, key dependent message. Um, consider a public key encryption scheme and uh, an encryption of a message M. The security of uh, the public key encryption scheme guarantees that uh, the message, the plain text M, is hidden as long as the secret key um, is not revealed. But now consider the message calls the secret key itself. Then uh, to hide the secret key, you need to rely on the security of the public key encryption scheme. And to argue security of the, the scheme, you need um, the secret key to be hidden in the first place. So there is a circular issue here. And in fact, in, in general, it's not clear um, if uh, whether semantic security of a public encryption implies key-dependent message security, where in general, the message can depend on the secret key. So the adversary can choose a function and gets an encryption of the function applied on the secret key. And security should still hold, uh, even in the presence of such encryptions. So this um, uh, setting can appear uh, a little bit artificial, maybe, at first sight, but in fact it, um, it arises in many different uh, settings. Uh, the example would be fully homomorphic encryption, where, um, uh, which uses um, Gentry's bootstrapping, where a homomorphic encryption encrypts its own secret key. But it's also used uh, in many other places, such as function secret sharing, or it's used to build designated verifier uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, or even in uh, very recent uh, IO constructions. Let me present you the state of the art for key dependent message security of um, encryption. The first important result uh, will be an amplification theorem that says that to achieve KDM security uh, for any function described uh, by a bounded South circuit, it is sufficient to prove KDM security for a much restricted class of function, namely affine functions. And it turns out uh, there exists some KDM secure chosen plane secure encryption scheme for affine functions. And in fact, you can build it from pretty much any uh, assumption that gives public key encryption, such as DDH, uh, LWE, quadratic residuosity, LPN, CDH. So the case of um, KDM chosen plain text attack is well understood. Uh, it's pretty much solved. Um, but how about chosen cipher text attack? which is a de facto security notion for encryption and because it captures, in, in particular, man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, CCA and KDM encryption is much harder to get. This has been solved by Kameni Shetel, um, which built KDM CCA secure encryption scheme from any KDM CPA secure plus an IZK um, that relies on the Naur Young paradigm. But this comes at um, the use of extra assumption and IZK. Uh, Dennis Hoffines built directly from pairings KDM CCA secure encryption, which is simpler and more efficient. But still, the pairings is a qualitatively stronger assumption that's what's needed for public key encryption, for KDM CPA public key encryption. Um, uh, Kitagawa and Tanaka in 2018 showed that um, any CCA in CCA encryption that relies on hash proof system uh, that can be built from DDH, QR, or decisional composite residuosity, um, which are similar assumptions that what's needed for KDM CPA encryption, all of this can be upgraded to KDM CCA. All right. And later on, Kitagawa and Matsuda showed that, in fact, KDM CPA encryption, KDM CCA encryptions are equivalent, which is remarkable uh, because this is not known to be true in the in CPA uh, for in CPA in CCA encryption. 
This is true in the KDM world. Uh, so all of this to say that the um, situation for KDM secure public key encryption is well understood. The case is pretty much solved. Even though for KDM CCA encryption, it took much longer and it was more uh, challenging. So now the question is, uh, what about KDM security for more advanced encryption schemes? In fact, the example I gave, such as fully homomorphic encryption, require a circular security of um, more advanced encryption scheme than simple vanilla public key encryption. Our contribution to answer this question tackles the case of identity-based encryption, which is one of the simplest non-trivial generalization of public key encryption. It's fairly well understood. In fact, you can build identity-based encryption from all uh, of these assumptions that give public key encryption. It's a natural starting point to answer this question. Let me recall briefly what identity-based encryption is. Essentially, identity-based encryption is a public key encryption where any bit string can serve as a public key. So there are some public parameters in the sky and with this, anybody can encrypt a message under some identity, which could be, for example, an email address, and that serves as a public key and um, users receive specific secret key, which are called user secret key, and which depend on their identity. And with this, um, users are able to decrypt the message as long as the identity match here. And if the identity don't match, the user secret key should not reveal anything about the encrypted message. So these users secret key are generated from a so-called master secret key um, that is built by a trusted third party. In fact, security should even if an adversary gets access to many user secret key, as long as none of the uh, corrupted user secret key can decrypt the ciphertext. This is standard security for identity-based encryption. The only known result for DM secure identity-based encryption from standard assumption is by Alperin, Sheriff, and Pikert. And they consider a setting where, in addition to user secret keys, the adversary gets access to encryption of messages that are functions of user secret keys chosen by the adversary. And they build this from LWE. Uh, this is an interesting first step, but in fact, uh, it fails to capture some application. In particular, a, one interesting application of IBE is to get CCA secure public encryption by the CHK transform. And in fact, this notion of KDM security doesn't allow to obtain KDM CCA secure encryption. Um, so a stronger notion is master key KDM security, which is essentially the same, except now the adversary can get access to encryptions of messages that are functions on the master secret key, not the user secret key. And that turns out to be sufficient uh, to apply the CHK transform, among other things. So this is a more de desirable and a stronger KDM security notion. And this is what we achieve in our work. So we build this from standard assumption in pairing groups. So first, uh, I'll recall briefly how the KDM CPA encryption of BHHO works because this is um, a building block uh, for our construction. Um, and it relies on the DDH assumption. And then I'm gonna show that these actually BHHO techniques are compatible with um, a, some identity-based encryption that rely on pairings that um, um, use the dual system encryption methodology introduced by Wetters. And in fact, um, Combining these two is possible, but it's not enough to get KDM uh, identity-based encryption. And I'll show you in the last step how to actually get um, the result we, we want. All right, so let's see how the KDM CP encryption of BHHO looks like. So um, we'll be using a prime order group generated by little g. And for now, think of the secret key as just a random vector of exponent. Um, 
and the public key contains a random vector of group elements, g to the a, here, and also um, the inner product of this g to the a with k in the exponent, which is just one group element. To encrypt, um, one samples a random exponent r and computes a randomized variant of the public key. So this is going to be g to the a times r. I just exponentiated the vector here. And uh, the key encapsulation here will also be just a randomized version of that. And this is multiplied by a message that is a group element. So to decrypt it is simple. You just uh, use the secret key and multiply it with the header of the ciphertext here to get the encapsulation key and recover the message. So far, so good. Um, there is a problem, though. Um, if we want to get KDM security, that means the message is going to be a, a fine function on the secret key. However, there is a mismatch between the ciphertext space, which is a group element, and the secret key space, which is uh, exponents. And also, uh, to apply the amplification results that I mentioned, what we want is actually an affine function on the uh, binary decomposition, on the bit description of the secret key. So the way BHHO solves this issue is by taking a secret key to be a vector of group elements, g to zk, instead of uh, exponents. But still, to decrypt, one needs to recover k, the vector of uh, exponents. So to solve this dilemma, BHHO um, uh, sets the vector k to be a bit string uh, so that it's actually efficient to brute force the, and get the discrete logarithm of g to zk so that decryption is efficient. Of course, uh, the dimension needs to be taken appropriately large so that there is enough entropy in the secret key to ensure security. Um, so now let me show you the, INC the techniques used to prove uh, NCPA security of the scheme, even before going into KDM security. So security will rely on a computational assumption, which is DDH, and which uh, says that it is hard to distinguish a random vector um, that is proportional to G to the A, right? So it's blue, it's in the span of G to the A, it's G to the A raised to some exponent, from a uniformly random vector of group elements, g to the u, that does not lie in the span of g to the a. All right, so these two things are computationally indistinguishable. And now, at this point of the proof, we will rely on a statistical uh, argument. A random vector k multiplied by a blue element uh, vector is independent statistically from a random vector k multiplied by a linearly independent uh, vector of group elements g to the u. So linear independence translates into statistical independence. All right, and so for this we know this is called a universal hash function. And now because this value here is completely independent from that value, it can serve as a one-time pad and hide the message m. All right, this is roughly how the proof goes. Um, and now suppose actually the mes message is of the form k times w plus gamma and a fine function of the key. Uh, now we will use this g to the u and we will shift it appropriately just like this so that um, this basically removes the um, key component of the message. And now we are back essentially to the previous setting of NCPA encryption. Okay, uh, so we will be using the same statistical argument um, to hide the message. All right, which is switched to zero. So this is what we obtain. At this point, we want to switch back this red vector here, g to the u, back to the span of a. All right, 
The reason we do that is because we, mm, we want to basically um, move on after we've done the first challenge ciphertext. So we have made this challenge ciphertext independent of the message. And we want to keep doing this for many challenge ciphertexts. And every time we'll be using entropy from the secret key K. And we, more precisely, we'll be using the projection of K under the red, the red space. Um, so to do that and to use it as a one-time pad, we need to switch back uh, every type of text back to the blue space here, all right? But uh, the, the header of the cipher text will still be in the red subspace. That means it's, it's still not in the span of A, G to the A, right? And this is because we have performed this switch, which was necessary to prove uh, KDM security. So as I said, then we move on to the next challenge ciphertext and we repeat the exact same argument, right? Using and so on and so forth. So now uh, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna explain exactly the same proof again, but in a much higher level view. So that was a little bit technical. Now I'm just gonna abstract away most of the details and I'm gonna repeat the proof. So now for the sake of simplicity, consider the secret key as two bits of entropy, the blue bit and the red bit. The public key allows to create ciphertext with the blue entropy, uh, which contains a header and an encapsulation that hides the message, which is a function of the secret key. So the proof we've just seen uh, starts by switching the ciphertext from the blue space to the red space using the DDH assumption. And now the statistical argument uses the entropy of the red space, which is not revealed by the public key, um, to hide the message f of sk, as we have seen before. Switch back the encapsulation to the blue space. And we move the next ciphertext and so on and so forth. This is how the proof looks like. So now let me show you that existing identity-based encryption from pairing are compatible with the BHHO proof techniques. In particular, that is the case for IBE relying on the methodology that's called dual system encryption by Waters. In this IBE, we have now a secret key that's called a master secret key that uh, has before as two bits of entropy, the blue bit and the red bit. Public key allows users to compute ciphertext with blue bits of entropy and that are associated with identity. The new technical novelty here is that the adversary not only gets to see the public key and the challenge ciphertext, but also user secret keys, which uh, in this IBE looks like this. They are the master secret key, which contains the blue and the red bit of entropy, plus a mask that lies in the blue subspace. And now we want to do the same proof as BHHO, which first involves switching the ciphertext blue component to the red component using a subgroup membership assumption, in our case DDH. And so that is done in the current um, challenge ciphertext here. And now uh, the hope is to use the entropy from that red block to hide the message, to act as a one-time pad. But now the statistical argument that was used before doesn't hold, in particular because the user secret key partially reveals some information about this red entropy. They contain the red entropy bit of the master secret key. So that doesn't hold anymore. We'll solve this technical challenge using dual system encryption methodology, which consists of first a switching one by one the user secret key uh, from, so we'll switch this, um, this block from blue to red, again, using a computational assumption. So we'll have two computational assumptions, one in the ciphertext space and one in the secret key space. So technically, uh, the ciphertext will belong to a group G1, 
secret key will belong to group G2, both of which are prime order. And they will be combined using what's called a pairing, uh, which goes from G1 to G2 and ends up in the target group. And it's possible to assume DEH in G1 and G2. All right, so this is what allows to switch from blue to red in our case. And so once we've done that for a particular user secret key, we will be using a statistical one-time argument that uses the fact that the identity from this user secret key doesn't match the identity from the current challenge ciphertext. In fact, it should not. If the identity match by correctness of the scheme, we should be able to recover the message and there would be no security. So we need to use the fact that this identity don't match and this is where it's used. This argument is one time, this is important. It's um, in the case of identity-based encryption, it typically relies on pairwise independent hash function. And it allows us to say that this red block, this entropy is independent from that one. And so this red entropy can serve as a mask for the red entropy bit of the master secret key here. So what that does is um, remove the red bit of entropy of the master secret key. So now we have a, like a truncated user secret key that doesn't even decrypt correctly the chain ciphertext we are considering. But that's okay, it was not supposed to decrypt it anyway because the identity don't match. And of course, as a sanity check, this user secret key should still be able to decrypt correctly, honestly generated ciphertext from the public key. Right, so to summarize, and this is the core ideas of dual system encryption methodology, there is two types of key, of user secret key. The full one uh, that contains all the bits of entropy of MSK that decrypts blue ciphertext and red one, which allows to switch from blue to red and there is no way to notice the difference. And then there is a truncated user secret key, which is technically called semi-functional, which only decrypts correctly the honestly generated ciphertext, but not the challenge ciphertext. All right. So what have we done here? We was, uh, so after that, we switched back the mask to the blue space. So we've done, um, effectively, we've hidden completely the red entropy bit of the master secret key, we've removed it from the user secret key. All right. And this will be done uh, again for every user secret key one by one. All right, so we'll just repeat the exact same argument and so on and so forth. Um, at the end, we'll essentially have removed the red component of all the user secret keys. And now we can ignore them and perform the exact same BHHO proof as we've seen before. Now we can actually say this red block here will statistically hide the message. And we're done. With, well, we are done for the first challenge cipher. All right. Now it seems like we have succeeded to build a master key KDM secure identity based encryption. But in fact, uh, let's be careful here. We'll, we have only considered one challenge ciphertext. And you may think, oh, well, let's just do a hybrid argument and do the exact same thing for all ciphertexts one by one. But in fact, that doesn't work. We'll see why. And also note that as opposed to the typical in CPA setting, uh, for which one challenge ciphertext implies many challenge ciphertexts generically using the hybrid argument, this is not the case for KDM security. Right. One challenge ciphertext does not imply many challenge ciphertext. So what goes wrong if to the second ciphertext, we'll do the same proof again. So it starts with the blue space and we want to turn it into, uh, like we were going to turn this blue boxes into red boxes using computational assumption. But first, a, if we want to be able to switch blue to red, this should not be noticed by the adversary. In particular, if you have a user secret key that's truncated, semi-functional, this is clearly noticeable. So the first thing we do, even before moving on to the second ciphertext, it's to switch back all of the user secret key to full mode. All right, just by reverting the changes we've done before. So we can do that. 
and and now we can perform the uh, same argument on the same cycle text so we switch it to red and so on and so forth and now uh, we want to rely on the statistical argument that we used before but it fails because this argument was one time and it only talks about one uh, identity the identity of one user secret key and one challenge ciphertext and it fails because here if you look at the header of the ciphertext there are many of them that are in the red subspace so in fact for this to work it would need to be an argument that taking, takes into account many challenge ciphertexts so we cannot use pairwise independence we need to use something stronger all right so typical dual system encryption uh, fundamentally fails for that reason, that it does not take into account many challenge ciphertexts at once. All right. So the technical reason is the the header here cannot be switched back to blue because of the shift I've showed you before. All right. So we need to use another argument. So as I've said, our scheme uses a an argument that um, that uh, handles all the ciphertext challenge ciphertexts at once. All right, and this borrows techniques from uh, Hoffine's uh, caution tricks, uh, which actually achieves this in a different setting. Namely, they achieve they they show techniques that handles many giant ciphertext to get tightly secure identity-based encryption, where the security loss does not grow with the number of challenge ciphertext. So these techniques. Uh, we adapt and they were from fairly different contexts and this is remarkable that it's useful and to achieve uh, a different goal namely KDM security for identity based encryption so this is the last uh, piece of uh, technical tools that we use to get master key KDM identity based encryption so to summarize we've built the first KDM secure identity based encryption which satisfied a master key KDM security where the adversary not only gets to see user secret keys but also encryptions of messages that are function of the master secret key which is strong enough to capture applications such as CHK transform to get KDM CCA secure encryption And natural open problems include building the same thing, but from weaker assumptions, such as CDH. This is a legitimate question to ask, since we know how to build identity-based encryption from CDH. And more generally, interesting question includes, uh, can we build KDM secure advanced encryption, for example, homomorphic encryption from standard assumption? concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention.